Good afternoon, everyone. Hello, my name is Linda Kerrigan Everett, and I am the EAP Wellness Coordinator, and we are in for a treat for our wellness webinar today. So I would like to introduce to Allison's. We are honored to have both of you today, and we will start with Allison Reinhardt. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us. My name is Allison Reinhardt, and I'm the manager of Workplace Health Services here at CDPHP. Without further ado, I am going to kick it right over to my colleague, Allison Durand, who is a registered dietitian and is going to talk to us about building our plate with healthy choices. Allison? Thank you, other Allison. Um, as was stated, I'm a registered dietitian with over 13 years of experience. I currently work at CDPHP and our community engagement team. So I'm out there doing programming in your communities. We also have some food security programs that I manage. Um, so that's my current role, but I have quite a varied background. If any of you are interested in connecting, I'm on LinkedIn. You should be able to find me pretty easily on there. But just a quick footnote to get us started. Um, this presentation is for informational purposes only and really should not be considered medical advice or a substitute for preventative health care. If you have questions regarding the information herein or how it relates to you personally, we recommend that you consult with your primary care physician or another qualified health care practitioner. So that's kind of legal jargon to say that everything in here is informative. It's not a recommendation. I unfortunately don't know all of you personally, and so I can't say that everything recommended in this presentation would be best for you. So it's best if you're wanting to make any changes, you do that with the participation of your PCP or healthcare provider. So today's emphasis is on the MyPlate model and how you can apply that at home, in the office, on the road. But before we jump to the MyPlate, I wanted to just give like some very high level nutrition 101. Um, I also have Allison, double L Allison in queue to monitor the questions that come in as the presentation goes along. So she'll fire them over to me as appropriate throughout. So if you do have a question, don't feel like you have to wait until the end. You can just put it right into the chat. And I am receiving the feedback that folks can't hear me. So please hold. Well, I try to adjust. My Allison, audio. I can hear you okay. I'm going to make some suggestions for those folks in the chat. Okay. Thanks. You're welcome. So, to get started, the MyPlate model is really a breakdown of these three macronutrients. So, all foods that we consume are a combination of carbohydrate, protein, and fat in some way or shape or form. The proportions that you see here, the percentages on the right, are a general guide of how much of your daily intake these three macronutrients should make up. Again, it really depends on what your personal goals are, what your health history is. That's why there's a broad range. But generally speaking, it's about 40 to 50 percent carb, 20 to 30 percent protein, 20 to 30 percent fat. So what are those individual macronutrients? Carbohydrates are really our energy source. I feel like they get a bad rap. But they're an important food group uh, because they're really the fuel to your cells, your cellular function, all of your metabolism, your body to just kind of breathe and have your heart beat and exist. There are some macronutrients that can replace carbohydrate for energy. You might have heard of a ketosis diet where ketones are used for energy. But there are certain cells in your body that can't use ketones. They have to have glucose, which is a carb. So those are your red blood cells in your brain which is why some people who go carb-free complain about being foggy or having memory issues. It's because their brain cells aren't getting the glucose that they need to function. So not a bad food group found in many foods, some of which might surprise you and we'll get to later, um, but basically just the source of energy for your cell. Now, an important thing is which carbohydrates that you choose. The preference is for more complex, whole and high fiber choices. And we will really dig into that a little bit later, uh, actually on the next slide. Protein is the next macronutrient, also pretty popular, most commonly thought of as meat. These proteins are made up of a variety of amino acids, and those amino acids are the building blocks of your muscle tissue and your cellular development. So they're very important for retaining your muscle mass, building new muscle mass, um, specifically for like your skin, your bones, and other skeletal structures and muscles, of course. Lastly, fat is an important nutrient to consume, but is also how any of these nutrients, if consumed in excess, 
it's going to get stored as fat in your body. Uh, fat has several important functions. It's insulation. It's kind of like the cushioning between all of your organs, the sheath on your cells. Uh, there's a lot of important value in consuming fat. Fat got demonized earlier in life. I think in like the 70s or 80s, everyone was doing like skim milk and low fat, everything. But all three of these macronutrients are important. It's really not recommended to eliminate any single one of them because they all, as you can see, have very important functions. Next, and this could be an entire presentation in and of itself, so I'm just going to give a high level, but these are some of the micronutrients and other miscellaneous dietary uh, items that are important. I mentioned fiber, so there's two types of fiber. There's soluble fiber and insoluble. Soluble fiber is like the meaty parts of fruits and vegetables and of grains, and it absorbs liquid, and it kind of goes through your intestines and your GI tract as like a sponge, and it absorbs things that you don't need anymore, and it gets it out of you. That's kind of how Cheerios makes their claim to fame for heart health is they have a lot of soluble fiber. And so it helps act as like the scrub brush to lower cholesterol by getting cholesterol out of your GI tract and preventing your body from recirculating it. Insoluble fiber is roughage. So think like anything that's not going to get broken down. It's like the skins and peels of fruit, nuts, seeds, corn, popcorn. Those are really like what provide bulk to your bowel movements. And they're important for ensuring that things pass along, making you feel full, um, feeding your microbiome, lots of importance in fiber. So that's why it's good to pick carbohydrates that have more fiber. A general goal is about 25 to 30 grams of fiber per day. And sadly, most Americans fall short of that because we eat so much processed food. And the most fiber is found in the food as it comes out of the ground or the earth. And as you begin to process it and work with it and change it, you kind of lose fiber as you go along. So better choices, higher fiber choices over here, closer to how the food originated. Water is a very important, if honestly, probably the most important nutrient. You could live weeks without food, but you could only live a couple days without adequate water. Our bodies are two thirds water, which is a statistic I'm sure you've heard before, but it is also the medium in which your metabolism functions. So if you're on a weight loss journey or a muscle building journey and you're dehydrated, you're already kind of setting your system off to poorly function because you don't have a proper lubricated system to run with. It's found in mostly, most people think of just frank water, but it's also found in like fruits, vegetables, the broths of soup, um, smoothies. There's all sorts of ways to get water into your diet, preferably from choices that are non-alcoholic, non-caffeinated, and either low or calorie free, since you're already gonna get so many delicious calories from your food. Energy is the measure of calories, really. Um, I feel like they get a little bit demonized in this society, but over in Europe, they don't write calories on their foods, they write energies. And it's really just a measure of how much density of nutrition there is in a food. A complicated explanation exists, but we don't have time for it today. All you need to know is like, cal all calories are not created equal. So think of 100 calories of almonds versus 100 calories of cola, right? So calories alone is not the best measure of the nutritional value of a food because some very healthy choices might have higher calorie counts to them, but it still makes them a really great choice. Lastly, we have our micronutrients that covers vitamins, minerals. Um, again, could be an entire presentation on itself. I didn't want to exclude them, but we won't really dig into them today. <clears throat> Hey, Allison. Yes. We do have one great question about fiber. Um, and the question is, if you alter the fruit or vegetable, like cooking apples into applesauce or chopping up fruit and veggies into a smoothie, does that affect the fiber content? Excellent question. Um, it does to an extent, but it's a bit of a spectrum. So if you keep the peel on, so the smoothie example, oh no, I've lost my light. The smoothie example, where you're keeping the whole fruit with the peel and everything, and you're just blending it up, you'll lose a little bit of fiber because you're breaking it up and you're just pre-digesting it, if you will, but at least you're retaining it and you're gonna consume it. Whereas if you like peel potatoes and then cook them and then mash them into mashed potatoes, you basically removed a lot of the fiber from the food. So the more heavily processed something is, and the more you've removed those bits of fibrous material, the less fiber the food will ultimately have at the end. And heat does also, break up fiber particles. So um, if you like overcook your vegetables or, you know, 
some people like like to steam their vegetables till they're kind of like soft and mushy. And for some people, that's perfectly appropriate. But that's going to have less fiber than just like an al dente steamed version of the vegetable. Thank you. Welcome. So the my plate model. How did we get here? Um, you might remember this pyramid. This is a bit dated for me. I feel like I saw this when I was very small. You'll see the biggest chunk is taken up by grains and carbohydrates. Um, not super useful as far as how to apply this to your individual diet. From here, we went to this my period. The biggest change is they added the, the person running up the side to indicate fitness as an important component of a healthy diet. But again, not great application to how we build our plates and eat as human beings. So we've moved to the my plate model. And I'm sure you've seen this, but Basically, you'll see half of the plate comes from fruits and vegetables. A quarter of the plate are grains, or I like to say carbohydrates, and I'll explain that further in a moment. And then a quarter of the plate protein. So you can think of this as your individual meals or your full day of intake. But the goal is like half of what you eat should be coming from plants, primarily as close to their original form as possible. We should really be using carbohydrates and proteins as complements and sides to that. So into the half of your plate becoming fruits and vegetables. There's several tips on here for how you could implement this in your lives, depending upon where you're at in the world. I do want to make this interactive. So if you have additional ideas, feel free to throw them in the chat, please. We'll kind of shout out some of our favorites. But the takeaway is any if you're right now having like a sliver of fruits and vegetables on your plate, that's totally fine. Going to half might be a leap. But anywhere where you can make that little sliver a little bit bigger is the goal and is going to lead you to a more nutritious, healthy intake. So some examples. Um, the first, and you'll hear me say this throughout because it's honestly the most simple and the most important, is you're going to eat the foods that you surround yourself with. So if you want to eat more plants, it's advisable that you purchase more plants. If you want to eat more fruit, and I'm saying this as much to myself as I am to all of you, I don't eat a lot of fruit, so I've made a conscientious effort to eat more of it by putting a big bowl of fruit right on my counter. And while I'm having my coffee in the morning, I'll like grab a couple of grapes or like bite into an apple, peel an orange. So having them, purchasing them is step one, preparing them in a way that makes them simple and easy to consume is step two, and then making them visible. So if you buy all of your produce and you shove it in the bottom drawer of your fridge and then you like lay that bag of salad over top, you're much less likely to consume those foods than if you chop them up, roast a couple carrots, put them in individual containers and have them ready to go with you to work. So you'll see through these suggestions, that's kind of the general recommendation is how can you add more fruits and vegetables to what you're already eating? That could be putting spinach and mushrooms or peppers and onions on your pizza. It could be blending additional vegetables and stirring them into your marinara sauce. It could be sauteing peppers, onions, mushrooms, beans, whatever you want, into pasta sauce before you have pasta. It could be adding. So the other day um, at our cafeteria here at CDPHP, they had broccoli cheddar soup. And I was like, this looks lovely, but it looks like mostly cheese that I would eat with a spoon, which I'm not mad about because I love cheese a lot. Um, but I took it home and I was like, I could make this better. So I had a bag of frozen broccoli. I laid a nice layer of frozen broccoli at the bottom, poured that soup over top, microwaved all of it, and I ate basically like a whole cup of vegetables with a little bit of broccoli cheddar soup instead of what would have been like a cup of cheese with some bits of broccoli. So that's kind of how I want you all to think about this, is how can I take what I already eat? I'm not going to revamp my whole diet because because that's not realistic. But how can I add to what I'm already doing? So let's see. I see unsweetened Greek yogurt in the chat. That's a great thing to dip frozen or fresh fruit into. So I just bought some beautiful blackberries. You could spear one of those and dip it in yogurt instead of just eating the yogurt with a spoon. Adding frozen spinach to everything's another great suggestion. Frozen vegetables are like the most untapped secret out there. They live forever in your fridge. You could add them to quite literally everything and they have them on hand. They don't expire. You don't have to worry about them going bad. Um, Allison, we had a storage question. Um, why do they hide the fruit and veggie crispers in the fridge? At the bottom? Yeah. So I, that's a great question. I don't even know that I have the credentialing to answer that, but I could speculate that for freshness, it's best if they're kind of contained, which is why they're in those crisper features. The fact that they're in the bottom confuses me because from like a food service standpoint, you wouldn't want fresh food below like raw meat and things. 
I honestly don't know. Besides the crisping and the wanting to keep air somewhat limited from exposing them and making them rot faster, but beyond that, I'm really not sure. We can find out though and report right. back to the group. We've got a lot of great questions in the chat, and I am going to try to get to as many as I possibly can. I know we've still got some excellent content we want to share with folks. Yeah, I will keep cruising along. Um, so I talked a lot about at home just to cover like in the office or out to eat. If you get a sandwich every day from your favorite substation, make a point to add banana peppers, jalapenos, spinach, cucumbers, whatever your jam is, um, sprouts. There's all sorts of vegetable options out there. Or if you're out to eat, order a salad as a starter so that you're getting your lettuce in. So a pro tip is I like to eat my vegetables first so that I know they've been consumed. They're down there. I've got my vitamins, my minerals, my fiber from them. And it also fills me up a little so that I can better control my portions of the protein and carbohydrates. So that's something you can do out to eat is start with something that's like vegetable based and then make a concerted effort to reserve or pack up to take to go the rest of your meal that maybe is a little more like protein carb heavy. Um, a lot of places will allow you to substitute or add vegetables. There's some pasta places that will let you get like the sauce over just sauteed vegetables instead of pasta if you want. So just, I mean, shoot your shot and ask for it. And anywhere that you can slip a fruit or a vegetable in, the better, because you want it to really be the majority of what you're eating. Next, we have the grain category, which again, I'm kind of generalizing to say carbohydrate. So I talked a lot about vegetables, but I want to call out a handful of vegetables that are considered starchy vegetables. This will be like the first quiz question is in the chat. Does anyone know what they think or know what a starchy vegetable is? What a type? Yes, potatoes, which are my favorite food, by the way. Corn, peas, yes. Carrots, no. So it's potatoes, sweet potatoes, corn, peas, winter squash. So that's like your acorn, butternut, um, pumpkin. Carrots, get, they are presumed to be starchy, but they actually don't constitute they don't qualify to be starchy vegetables. So all vegetables have a certain level of carbohydrate in them. Don't get me wrong. But these few that I listed, oh, root vegetables was a good one too, uh, are mostly, if not entirely comprised of starch, which is why on our plate, we'd want to count them more in that grain carb category than fill half of our plates with potato. So that would be a dream for me. Um, I just want to make that distinction that the non-starchy vegetables are really what you want to do half about. So I see in the chat, it says, what about rice? Rice is a carbohydrate. It's just not a starchy, it's not considered a starchy vegetable because it's a grain. So other things that count in this category are your grains, whole or anything made from them. So that includes like oats, rice, barley, amaranth, millet, couscous, risotto, orzo, but it also includes anything made from flour, which is, made, which is milled grains. So that would be breads, tortillas, chips, like tortilla chips, rolls, um, anything made from flour would also fall into this category. So it's pretty obvious that some of them are better choices than others. It goes back to the vegetable comment I made. It's like with all food groups, the closer you can eat it to how it came out of the ground, the better. So the more often you can choose an actual whole grain, like brown rice, like whole rolled oats, like amaranth, like barley, like buckwheat, the better. Quinoa is another popular one that's around these days. That's probably the best option. From there, if you are gonna consume something that's like a processed grain made from flour, much like the smoothie example from earlier, whole grain flour means they took the whole grain and just ground it up to make flour. The foods made from whole grain flours are your next best choice because that fiber, though it's broken down, it was retained in the flour. So um, I won't I won't get on my soapbox because I could, but the products made from whole grain flours, that whole industry is very sneaky. So, and they want you to buy it because they know that you're trying to do right by your health. So they're going to make the bread dark brown. They're going to put a farm on the front. They're going to say 17 grains, ancient grains, 100 grains, wheat bread. The front of the package, take with a grain of salt, because that's really, they want you to buy it. It's governed, but not as tightly as the ingredient list on the back. So when you're going to pick a food and you want to know if it's a whole grain product, flip that right on its side, look at the ingredient list and read the first ingredient. If it doesn't say brown rice, 
whole wheat flour, whole white wheat flour. If the word whole is not present, it is not a whole grain product. So um, something to consider. And I see in the chat, I'm kind of peeping over here as I can. So I see where water chickpeas considered. I'll cover them in the protein category. Uh, though they are technically starchy, I don't want to confuse you. We'll pin that for the protein slide, which is next. Going back to grains, how to incorporate more healthier grains in your diet. Some options listed here. Again, it's just really trying to like make the better choice when and if you can, whether you're at home or out or in the office. So starting at home, it means making whole grains. You could prepare a giant plate of like a oatmeal bake or a quinoa bake and slice that up for breakfast. Very easy, super quick. It's a minimal investment on the front end that leads to like several meals throughout the week. You can freeze it and have it later, but that would be a great option. You could add fruit to it to cover your half of fruit and vegetables. Purchasing whole wheat pasta and bread, if that's your jam, or trying to maybe substitute some alternative grains where you would plug pasta. So experimenting with brown rice and amaranth and millet and all sorts of grains that are out there. I will say the grains um, absorb a lot of their flavor from what they're cooked in. So if you're going to make brown rice or quinoa, maybe try making it with a chicken broth or a vegetable broth or something with like a little of water with a little bit of vinegar, or a little bit of lemon juice or something so that you're getting flavor from the fluid because otherwise grains, grains can be kind of bland. In the office, um, choosing whole grain granola bars, keeping whole grain granola in your desk, just again, making these whole grain, higher fiber choices available to you, incorporating them into your lunches if you bring them. And then out to eat, sometimes you can make these substitutions. They can be tough to find, but that's to me, one of the best places to try different grains is to have a professional chef cook it for you. And then you get to try it out and about. So, I mean, dare yourself to try something different. And next time you see like a couscous salad or a quinoa or something on the menu, go for it and see if that's something you might be able to make at home. I know we've got just a couple of minutes left in our time together today, and I really want to make sure Allison is able to get through the rest of her presentation. So um, I am going to send a whole bunch of information to Linda. She will ensure that that gets out um, to well New York State folks uh, who are participating today. Um, so don't worry, we've got your back. Allison, take it away. Yeah, and if you um, if we have like a log of the chat, you can send me these questions in an email too, and I'd be happy to respond some some answers to you. So last but not least is the protein category, also a quarter of the plate, and this represents both plant and animal protein. So I bring back the chickpea question. There are certain plants that are high in protein, such as nuts, seeds, beans, lentils, pulses, legumes, nut butters, so like peanut butter, sunflower butter, all of those are a high protein choice that would fit into this category that also comes with the benefit of fiber and healthier fats. Then their animal counterparts, which would be chicken, pheasant, fowl, uh, beef, pork, seafood, scallops, shooters, all of it. So within the animal protein category, anything that has blood, is gonna have cholesterol. So you're gonna get cholesterol with those, you're not gonna get fiber, and you are also gonna get some of the unha unhealthy um, or less healthy saturated fats. So within the animal protein category, you want to gravitate to some of those leaner choices. That would be chicken, pheasant, turkey, rabbit, less so the beef, pork. Um, seafood's also very lean, so finned fish, scallops, shrimp, crab. A quick footnote, those shelled shellfish is very high in cholesterol, even though it's low in total fat. So if you're someone who's monitoring your cholesterol, you would want to kind of stay away from crab, shrimp, um, lobster. So again, the slide has for you several different ways that you can apply this logic while you're out, mostly picking leaner choices, maybe trying a plant-based protein meal once a week, um, incorporating more of those beans, nuts, and seeds into your day. Maybe you eliminate meat from one of your meals. The biggest thing here, I think, is portion size, which there is a slide coming on that, and how it's prepared. So if you get a chicken breast, but it's breaded and fried and smothered in chicken gravy, that's obviously different than like a grilled chicken breast. So just be cognizant of how much you're consuming, elect for lower fat preparation methods. And then again, while you're out or at home, experiment with different fish that you haven't had before. Try to make yourself a burger from 
black beans, just really kind of experiment with these different types of protein. So, as I said, I'm a big cheese enthusiast. I have a few tips of how you would apply this, though we've covered some of them. The first is just start tracking your consumption from a portion standpoint. And the homework you all have is like find a dish you love. Maybe it's cereal, maybe it's pasta, but ration out what you would eat and then take that and put that in a measuring cup and see how much it is because I bet you'll be surprised. Or an alternate study is for pasta, for grains specifically, the serving size is about a third of a cup. So measure that out and pour that on the plate you usually eat out of and just visualize what it looks like because a lot of times we're just over consuming in general. So he, this slide contains a few helpful guidelines of what is considered a serving size, like an appropriate serving size of these foods. The deck of cards is a popular one. And um, another one they say for meat is like the palm of a woman's hand is about three ounces, which is generally the recommendation for meats and proteins. Again, this isn't sound advice for every single person, because if you're a bodybuilder who's got tons of muscle mass, that's not enough protein for you, but it's a general rule of thumb. Uh, Lastly, and to recap from earlier, I mentioned just making the difficult choices hard and making the better choices easy. So like visibility is key. Buying the foods you want to eat is key. If there's something, you know, you have a real, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Like weakness for, I will throw myself under the bus. Those little cat, those little crunchy Cadbury eggs are my gem and I don't buy them. You know why? Because if I have them in my desk, I'm going to eat the whole bag of them. So I will reserve things like that to be purchased when I really want it. And you should apply that to anything that you know you shouldn't be eating. So like ice cream, you know, candy, cookies, baked goods. I'm not saying to remove them from your diet, but you should make it so that if you want them, you have to really put an effort to go get them. And you should make the healthier choices a no-brainer, that you could choose it at any corner in your kitchen because you filled your whole house with them. I wrote habit stacking on here. <clears throat> This is a behavior change tip where you take something you're already doing and you add a behavior that you want to do. So earlier I mentioned, I wanted to eat more fruit. So I make coffee for myself every morning while my coffee brews, I stand next to my coffee pot and I eat a little bit of fruit. So I've added to the habit that exists, which is making coffee, eating fruit, and that's habit stacking. You can apply that to really anything. Exercise is another good one. If you like books on tape, only allow yourself to listen to books on tape while you're walking, and now you have a stack. And we have the little graphic here about SMART goals. We have no place for ambiguity in our goal setting. You gotta take the guesswork out of it and be very specific with yourself. So pick a time, a place, a location, a frequency. So I wanna eat fruit with my coffee in the morning twice a week. It will be very clear at the end of a week whether or not I achieve that goal. If I were like, I just wanna eat more fruit, the end of the week, if I ate fruit once, is that more? Who knows? So when you're crafting goals for yourself, focus on the behavior, really set like a specific amount you want and a time frame, and then you'll know whether or not you've been successful. You'll get jazzed about it, hopefully build some momentum, make a new goal and build upon that. And that's really how these behaviors will last and stick. That I will turn it back over to Allison to wrap up. So we're very excited um, that we will also be supporting the nutrition from our friends at New York State um, with some fun, quick nutrition quizzes every Thursday in your daily to do. So make sure you're on the lookout for those. They should take you about one minute to go through. Uh, friends, I will make sure that I share the PDF version of this presentation with Linda, as well as some helpful handouts that can help you along your way to build your very best plate. Thanks so much for having us today and we wish you all a well day.